All right, here we go. Salute to Knicks Nation, special edition of Knicks Fan TV, man. CP the Franchise here with my special guest returning to the show uh, to talk Knicks. And we're also going to celebrate the release of his new album, The Mind of a Saint. And it is my guy, Sky Zoo. Sky, yeah, welcome yeah. back to Knicks Fan TV, man. Happy to have you back on, bro. Oh, peace, peace. What's up, bro? Listen, man, I'm happy to be here. You know, I have a ritual whenever the games is game night and all that. I might miss the game, but I have to catch Nick Fan TV. And you, you can ask my peoples. Everybody know you. I'm just going to the crib and going to the basement and kick back and, and watch Nick Fan TV with a bunch of junk food, man. That, that's what I look forward <laughs> to doing. So. It's good to be here, brother. Man, we, we appreciate the support, man, and all the love that, that you've shown us over the years, man, and uh, and happy to return the favor, man. And, and speaking of these Knicks, you know, they got a good win on the final game of the West Coast trip, 123-107 yeah. over the Blazers, man. What did you think about the game? It was a good one, man. Was, you know, that the beginning, man, that first quarter was like, what are we doing? Yeah. What was it like 14 nothing, 10 nothing, something? Yeah. Like, what are we doing, B? But – you know, um, we, we, that was one that we needed. You know, Portland is a team that, you know, if you're going to get a win out of a couple people, let that be one of them. And, you know, Dame is a monster and Simons is a monster. But, you know, obviously they kind of rebuilding. So we would have took the L on that one after everything that's going on. They would have been like, wait a minute. These are the games we're supposed to get, you yeah. know. So I'm glad we got that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we got that one, man. It was good to see them get off to, uh, you know, I, I thought a 2-2 two and two record on the on the road was realistic. I, I thought the Sacramento and the Clipper games will be tough. Lakers mm -hmm. without LeBron, even though they are tough, I thought that was still a winnable game. And then I saw this one as winnable as well. And so they they kind of won and, and lost the games that I, I looked I expected them to lose. But you know, right now they in the fifth seed in in the East. Eleven games left. What yeah. do you think about where things stand right now? I think it's smooth. I think it's a nice pocket for them. You know, obviously having a home court advantage would be great if we could kind of flip with Cleveland and be the fourth seed. But um, if we're going to be able to get somebody, I think that's one that we could kind of sneak out the back door with is a series against Cleveland. You know, we, we match up well against them. And uh, we, at times we have their number, but it's competitive, you know. So yeah. playing somebody like Philly in the first round or Boston in the first round and Milwaukee, that's going to be a nightmare. So we need to keep this up as far as being able to stay in that five spot, flip to the fourth spot, and, and that way we can really juggle some things right there. We, I think we can, on a seven-game run, we, we can run that with Cleveland. Yeah, I, I think we can play them tough, especially with this year's team. That's that's the ideal yeah. spot. I don't think we could catch them for fourth, but fifth. Fifth is a sweet spot, you know what I mean, yeah. to, to make things really interesting in this playoff race. You don't want to see Milwaukee right now. They're the best team, no. I think, in the, in the <laughs> entire league, right? Yeah. They're they ready to go get that chip again. And they they're looking very strong. Philly, yeah. a lot of people think oh Philly could be there with with Doc and his lack of adjustments, and you, and they have a history of falling apart. But right now, you know that Harden and B tandem, I wouldn't want to see that in the playoffs, man. And, and yeah, and be B would have a tough. field day, and, and B would have a field day without yeah. a doubt. Even if we was able to contain Harden and you know let him go in Soho and shop a little bit and get his mind off of us and you know get his attention somewhere else, you know how he like to burn and play in the street. Let him do that. We still got to worry about Embiid and Embiid to have a field day. So I'd like to stay away from that as long as possible. Yeah, that that would be tough, man. What what's been your biggest surprise of the season so far? I think Jalen Brunson has been everybody's, you know, and that's not a slight. Mm -hmm. That's more so an acknowledgement and and a round of applause for him. We all knew that he knew what he was doing, but we didn't see this. I don't think any of us did, and that's why the backlash was there as far as money and all that. Right. Now, when you look back. It's like, man, maybe they was on to something where that money is kind of light compared to what he's doing. I mean, he's clearly the best player on the team. What I like about him the most uh, is his IQ, you know, mm -hmm. what, what he can do up here, you know, as well as what he do on the court. His mid-range game where he's not afraid of traffic, not afraid of the paint, um, it, it's all incredible. He, he's been that guy. My only little gripe with him, and I know some people in the comments going to say, come on now, you sound like whatever. I love when my point guard got, got, got a certain amount of assists, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Having three assists a night is a little eh, for me, but I mean, we just picking just to pick at this point. And when yeah. we have a point guard where we can pick just to pick, then we good. You know what I mean? Because yeah. we from an era where we had none. And Nothing. we was, it, it, it was, it was duct tape and staples trying to put something together. We got a guy giving us 25 a night. And we can pick at the fact that he's getting three, four assists instead of seven to eight. I'll take that. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree with that, man. Like you said, when it's been patchwork for so long, it's, uh, for right. as far back as we can remember, uh, having him out there has been refreshing. You you saw how much he was missed, especially on this trip when they were looking for an answer in crunch time or they were looking for somebody to get the offense going or somebody who can just score, go, get out there and go get a yeah. bucket when the team needed him. You know, Brunson covers up so many holes on this team that I just hope, you know, they could get him back healthy in time for yeah. the playoffs and, and really make things interesting, man. But, you know, with the lack of assists, uh, you yes, you do want to see the, the assists go up there. I think team-wide, scheme-wise, you want to see that. You know, this team has been hovering around bottom of the league in almost every passing category. It's a very ISO-heavy offense between Brunson and Julius, and it's been working so far. You know, Knicks have a top-five offense in the league. I just hope yeah. that when the playoff time comes, uh, it doesn't come back to bite them. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. I want Brunson to get all the rest he needs. We saw what happened when they ran him out there too soon and, you know, he re-injured it. So yeah. you want him to kind of get all the way healthy, but it's like, that. can we afford to slip to six, seven, eight, nine, you know? So that's when you're hoping, like, IQ, IQ let, let's do it, baby. Like, it's on you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And he, he's been showing up. You know, you're putting him in bigger shoes for the first time and telling him, yo, go get it now. But he's he's been showing up, you know? So, um, Big fan of what IQ has been doing. I think he's absolutely earned his payday. I don't think you see him leave this summer. You know, I think they feel like, yeah, we got a bench guy. We got kind of a baby J.R. Smith in a sense, but a little more controlled as far as when to do certain things and when not. Yeah. So, um, you know, I I think he sticks around and, you know, it, it's, it's his show for a little while until my man can get his thing right. It's his show for a Yeah. Minute. I think Quickly's earned it, man. He's earned it. He, he, he stepped his Without game up tremendously this year. Defensively, he's been very impactful. And then offensively, it this is what we've been looking for for Quick. Just being an yeah. impact shooter, a consistent shooter. And he seems to be picking it up. You know, last night in Portland, he, he had a 26-point game, 10 rebounds for Quick. He's a good rebounding guard no, as well. So it's been good to that's see crazy. him pick that efficiency up, man. And, and he's been a lightning rod off the bench for them. No question about it. Yeah, I think the defense has been the most surprising thing for me personally. You know, his first couple seasons here, we knew he could score. We knew he kind of, you know, he was a bucket and he was streaking. He can go get it and whatever, kind of a chuck, kind of a gunner. And just seeing him flip the page and turn the page defensively has been really, really dope. You know, um, he, he's been really going after it. I think all that comes with confidence. The fact that Tibbs is like, all right, it's on you now. Go do it. Yeah. And he's doing it. It gets you excited to want to stop your man on the other end of the ball. So, you know, I, I think he's, uh, like you said, he's earned his bread, man. He's earned his position. Well, what did you think of uh, the Josh Hart acquisition, man? He's been another guy, you know, off the bench that win against against the uh, Portland Trailblazers. Seven assists, eight rebounds. I mean, yeah. just, just getting it done on, on both ends of the floor, man. What did you think about Loved Josh it. Hart since we got him? Loved it. I always was kind of into his game for a while, even the L.A. days and all that. I, I knew that, you know, he, he had something to him. And he's really been exactly what heads have needed exactly what heads have needed like yo this is the perfect plug and play player for what we're doing for the coach more than anything for the coach because it we saw that you could bring in whoever if tibbs ain't with it it ain't gonna fly you know what i mean like right, right. and and he's shown that he's with it and um you know i had heard he kind of was a tibbs guy like that kind of was that he was advocating for that which mm -hmm. is great so you're gonna bring somebody in we don't want to do what happened with cam again which was unfortunate for him because i actually like Cam. I, I know he's really talented so just seeing him sit there and not be able to do what he does shows you the coach is like, I don't care who brought in who. Yeah. It's me, baby. I'm I'm running this the way I want. So bringing Josh Hart in, you know, he's a tips guy and he's been it. Like you said, he's yeah. definitely been it. I mean, I'm seeing him sky over seven foot one dudes for rebounds, like head and shoulders above heads and like. He, he's really on it. I'm, yeah. I'm I'm happy with that pickup. The, the the motor is constantly at a thousand percent, man. Oh yeah, it's oh, yeah. It's, it's always at a thousand percent. And I think, especially in the playoff time, you're gonna need a guy like that who's gonna get in there and do the dirty work because things are gonna slow down, things are gonna get muddy, and it's gonna be a game of inches. You need those guys that's gonna do the little things, that's gonna continue to hustle, uh, be aggressive yeah. out there, play physical, and and play smart. That's one thing with Hart. He you know he he's not reckless. He's very controlled right. in his aggression, and I just thought, especially last night's game, where it just seemed like, you know, in the last game of a road trip, kind of seemed like they were ready to get back home mentally and physically. But when Hart mm -hmm. came into the game, he was like, "Nah, we got to win this game." You know, yeah, we yeah, win it's this time game, to go. And it's he, time he to go. We got over. another half of basketball to play. 
It's time to go. That's exactly what you need on a team like this. It's even yeah. changing the identity of the team on some, like, they're a gritty team. They're kind of a defense-first team. And these are kind of things that you saw the seeds being planted with. Yeah. But you needed that one extra person to come in and really bring it full circle and really get behind heads like, nah, let's, let's get to it. And he's been that guy in the, what, 13 games that he's been here. So yeah. I'm ready for that re-signing over the summer. You know, do what you got to do to make it right. He knows his position. He's cool coming off the bench and getting busy, even though he just started in Portland a couple months ago. I mean, you can't really ask for too much more, man. Him and Jalen Brunson are like best friends, it seems. So these are the elements that you need to make sure that this thing rolls smooth. So I, I think we eyed in that regard. Yeah, no question about it. Now, a, a little, you know, issue after last night's game. You Mitchell Robinson went on the Snapchat. I don't know if he's joking or being serious, but was was talking about the fact that he didn't like just going out there for 48 minutes of cardio. He wants more role in the offense. He wants to be involved a little bit more. What, what do you think about that? What's been your takes on Mitch and, and uh, the lack of offense? I agree with that sentiment based on what we're paying him. You know, like, and we're not paying him an, an astronomical amount of bread, but he does have a nice little contract and he's committed to us for four more years. I don't like when I go on the box score and I see he's got, you know, four points and, and five rebounds, you know, getting 15 or whatever per year for that. I mean, <laughs> What are we doing? You know what I mean? So, you know, I, I need my center to go out there and give me a double-double every night. You know, Shaq had a saying once, and it's, it's going to be different for Mitch because the offense isn't going to run through him right. with this roster. But Shaq had a saying like, yo, I just need seven points a quarter. If you break it down like that, I get seven points a quarter. I'm getting 28 a night. I'm good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm looking at Mitch like, yo, just go get four or five points a quarter. Get your 16, 20 points a night. Give me nine rebounds. No one's going to complain. You're probably going to be an all-star. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, go out there and, and you know, I, I need more than four points from Mitch. But then I look at the amount of shots he's taking, and it's like one for three. And I'm like, well, I can't even be that mad at him if he only took three shots. Right. So I just I need a little bit more emphasis on that. Take advantage of it. You know, if Julius is getting doubled, Jalen Brunson is getting doubled, take advantage of it. But that's where I come back with the assist with, with Jalen. I like Jalen Brunson a lot. Mm. I bought that jersey the first day they made it for sale, baby. <laughs> I wore it on tour in Switzerland, baby, first yeah. night. Yeah. But um, I need seven, eight assists from Jalen, man. That lane is packed. We know you get busy, baby. We know you can break down traffic. Yo, weave that rock around and let Mitchell get two right there. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and, and, and we can all eat the right way. I, I agree with you on that. I think it's a combination of – they, sh they should be looking for him a little bit more, especially in the pick and roll. Take advantage of, yeah. of his vertical spacing. He needs to do a better job of, of screening. But but I do think the guards need to do a better job of finding him because who wants to play a 48-minute game, 48 minute game where you're just sitting there on defense and running up and down the court? I so I think, I, it, I think it continues to help with the chemistry, with the cohesion. If, just get him involved. Throw him, throw him a little touchdown low if he, if he has a smaller uh, uh, matchup on a mismatch. Absolutely. Let him get Take activated. Yeah, see what's, see, see what's going on there. Um, but I think yeah. for Mitch also, number one, he's got to make his free throws. That's for one. Yeah. You know, make yeah. your free throws when they free at the charity stripe. That'll help you get some of those points. And also when he's around the rim, last year it seemed like he, he had a he had an easier time putting things back you know put getting putbacks for them this year right. he, he's, his hands have kind of been a little bit loosey-goosey man so i think yeah. he's got to tighten up there but i would like to see them find him a little bit more as well get him, in, yeah. get him involved absolutely so one of the things since since the knicks did take on the blazers yesterday dame lillard kind of came into the spotlight of the nba he was on the jj reddick podcast and was talking about it was a great interview but but talked about you know the nba changing saying this this is not the same NBA anymore, and he's just not sure how much longer he wants to play because he feels like the love mm -hmm. of the game is gone. And a couple of things, one of the things he spoke about was uh, he felt like there's a sense of entitlement now with the younger generation. A lot of the older vets, he, he spoke on the fact that when he came in, you still had the Jason Kids of the world. You still had, uh, uh, you know, uh, Grant Hill. You had Kurt Thomas, who was on the Knicks. Rasheed Wild, you know, those vets. A Jared, he spoke on Jared Jeffries, who we played with in Portland, who played on the, on the Blazers when he was 40. But he felt like, you know, with the younger generation coming in, there's a lot of entitlement culture going on now. And then he also spoke on um, the ring culture, how the discourse around the NBA is all about, you know, who's getting the ring, who's the MVP, who's this guy, who's that guy. And, you know, the, the actual love of the game is actually lost. What, what's your take on it? I agree with all that. I agree with all of that, man. That's why we're seeing the game played the way it's played, man. I'm, I mean, I'm seeing stats where it's like 
there's never been this many 40 point games in a season or 50 point games in a season. I mean, you got random guys, a seventh guy on the bench dropping 40 because no one's playing defense. Everyone's shooting a million threes a game. You know, the game has turned into so many other things. And I love basketball, man. I love the game. I love the sport. But I agree with him 100%. You know, and everybody wants to win. You want to go get that ring and all that. But it was, yo, I'm going to go out there and go up against whoever, right? It's who I'm with. It's who I came in with. Yeah, guys got traded here and there. But, you know, the the grouping up together, the, the super teaming and all that, and, you know, Outside of getting traded on some, I'm going to go here to do this. I'm going to flip. Yo, I wanted to push my way here. Work. Now I'm going over here. Work. We talking about them guys over on the other side of the bridge. You know what I mean? Yeah. And all that. Where it's like, yo, I'm here. We going to do it. We taking over the city. Ah, uh, you know what? I'm out. You know what I mean? Like, and all these different things where it's just like, it wasn't like that. Everybody's buddy, buddy. You know, the 90s heads wanted to kill each other. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Like, we was we was livid when, you know, Scotty dunked on Pat and and pointed them down, like, yo, right. sit down. And, you know, Pat jumped up and everybody wanted to kill each other. Yeah, That's what it was. It was like, yo, we, it wasn't buddy-buddy, you know? So how, how you going to compete and want to take somebody's head off on the court when before and afterwards y'all was kicking it and hanging and, you know, going to Carbone and all, like, how do yeah. you, how, how you have that competitive fire now? That's why you don't see Dame clicked up with a lot of people. And I like that. Like, of course, he got his friends in the league, but you don't see him with everybody and they've right. been begging this man to leave Portland. He won't do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I, I respect that. Uh, I'm telling you, man, last 10 years, my favorite players in the league was uh, with Melo and Dame. No, word up. facts. Melo word and Dame. Up. Dame, Dame continues my love. Word up. Yeah, man. Dame's still, still my favorite player in the league. Um, Absolutely. So, I, you know, it's commendable. It's very commendable, especially in the, in this ring culture that we celebrate it's very commendable that he stayed loyal to the Blazers, even after signing yeah. his second and third contract. And he's still mm-hmm. there. He's absolutely yeah. still there. Yes, he wants to win. I'm sure he wants to win there. But I, I do commend him on that. As far as, like, the entitlement issue, I think both the entitlement issue and, and the ring culture is based on uh, the proliferation of, of media and, and social right. media, you know, with with – you have accounts, especially on Instagram, right? Where and Austin Rivers kind of touched on this. It's about the highlight culture, and and the big plays, the big splash that these kids are making from the high school, the AAU level into college. These guys are being celebrated before they even get into the league. I mean, yeah. Lamelo Ball had a million followers on Instagram before he even <laughs> t- before he even bounced the basketball yeah. in the Zion NBA. Too. Zion, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So these guys, and now it's now it's Wembyama. Wembyama's games in in Europe are being covered on the NBA. He's not even in the NBA yet. So right. I think it's it's just a proliferation of of media and social media where we're on that twenty four seven news cycle. The the sports talk, the sports debates, your first takes, your skips and shannons, your, your next fan TVs, everybody's <laughs> talking about it. And so I think it's it's just a natural evolution where that's just where the conversation is going. You know, that's yeah. just where the conversation no, is going. Hundred percent. And you know, I think it even goes down to even something as similar as like the issue with the dunk contest, you know, like the brands. Well, right. I ain't doing it because right. if I lose my brand and take a hit and I won't get this, and get, you know, yeah. so like yeah. it all comes down to everything that Dame is kind of saying is like an entitlement, you know, and and um, I agree with him 100 percent on that. I think it's awesome that he pointed that out, but he's never been one to shy away from keeping it 100 and keeping it a being. So, you know, yeah. I'm not surprised that it was him who put that on the table, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Me, me neither, man. And, you know, it's like. The, the players have, have fought for, you know, the freedom to move around. But it's just hard, like you mentioned, like like with the Katie and Kyrie situation where they came to Brooklyn, they had carte blanche. They had everything. Yep. The world was their oyster. They had everything. Yep. And yep. for whatever reason, it still hasn't come out yet, right? Right. Whatever reason, from Harden to, to Katie to Kyrie, something was going on behind the scenes that, that we right. don't know. But right. I just felt like as soon as Harden was gone, then Kyrie was gone. Two days later, KD, KD was like, "All right, I'm out." Right, right. I'm absolutely. Out. And and you know, and they talked crazy the whole time to us. And I'm ne- I'll never let that go. Yeah, I'm right, blue right. orange. I'm, yeah. I'm Brooklyn all day, born and raised. But I don't rock with 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 the Nets and that Barclays. So I'm never letting that go. They talked crazy. The word on the street was we wasn't the cool thing. You know right. what I mean? Like, right. 
I was the word on the street, according to these guys. And now they running around in the desert and they running around in, in Dallas with heels. You know, like, come on, yeah. Yeah, like, come on, be like, we wasn't the cool thing, though. You right. know, like you said, they had carte blanche to do whatever they wanted. You want so-and-so, got him. You want Ben Simmons, got him. You want Harden, got him. Like, whatever it yeah. took. You want this coach, got him. Whatever it's going to be. And none of that mattered. You know, has got up out of there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's all, you know, I look at the Dame thing, even in the Dame interviews, like, you know, I want to see my teammates win. I want to see my teammates get paid. I, it's about the journey for Dame. And I look at the KD situation, it was like, as soon as things weren't in his favor, he was like, oh, send me to Phoenix, I'm out of here. Right. You know, yeah, twice, because he wanted to go there over the he summer. He wanted to go there over the summer. So it shows you, like, if, if, if that happened in the summer, okay, so from the summer to now, before he got traded, it was his mind really all the way there because it was very easy to say that's where I want to go right again. we talked about it before I want to go that's where I really so was your mind really where it needed to be here and Katie's a hell of a player I'm never going to doubt what his focus is on the basketball court but when it comes to seeing what the team is and being able to say okay this is somewhere I want to be he's never going to take a playoff so I, when I say yeah. where his, his mind was I don't mean as far as his talent and him putting the effort in not at all right but right as far as the team, right? We're building the team this way. Commitment. It may not, we may not win a ring this year because there's a lot going on with Kyrie and this and this, whatever, whatever. Are you here? And his mom might have been like, I'm not here. I'm gonna play and get busy and put my best foot forward and put the effort, but I'm not here because I do wanna go to the other side. I do wanna go to Phoenix, you know? So it's like, well, we don't really want heads here like that, you know? Like, yeah. So I'm, I'm just happy it ain't us, baby. Like, we good on this side. I'm just happy it ain't big, us. Big facts. It's something that you could be thankful for is that you got 12 guys in that Nick Locker room that's bought in. They playing for yeah. each other. They committed to each other. They bought in with the coach. You know, despite what some yeah. fans might think, they locked in with Tibbs right now. And so yeah. you got to be thankful for that no matter where they end up this season, man. The, the stability is, is certainly important. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. And we're talking to Sky Zoo. Salute to Knicks Nation, man. CP the Franchise here with our special guest, Sky Zoo. Uh, Sky, the new album, The Mind of a Saint. What would yeah. you talk about the concept behind that album, man? Oh, man. Yeah, The Mind of a Saint, available everywhere now, produced by uh, the other guys, which is an awesome producer duo out of D.C. And so the album is a conceptual album where I'm rhyming from the perspective of Franklin Saint of Snowfall, hence why I'm, you know, repping. Uh, so the ironically, the idea came from a homie of mine who at the time was a, a very high ranking exec with the Portland Trailblazers of all places. Oh, wow. So, okay. Uh, yeah, shout out to my Full man circle. Kerry. Full circle. Yeah, shout out to my man Kerry. He, um, you know, he, he's a, a, a big supporter of mine and we're homies and all that. And he was coming to me with ideas just randomly, just, you know, loving the music so much. Mm -hmm. And he had said something about doing a project sort of like this and like a snowfall type project. Mm -hmm. It wasn't this, but he had this idea of like a snowfall inspired project that he had been hitting me about trying to do for a while. Like, yo, that would be crazy if you did this. Just on some cool fan shit and then um, all the cool fan stuff. <laughs> nah, it's all, it's all <laughs> family show. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when, when he was hitting me with it, I was like, yo, you know what? I don't know if I'm going to do that. But I think I'm going to kind of take this seed that you planted with the, the Snowfall idea and, and expand on it in another way. And it became me doing an album as Franklin Saint. So with the album, the entire album, man, it's, there's no Sky Zoo. There's no mention of Sky Zoo. I tell people mm. every breath on the album, every word on the album, every thought, every moment, they're not mine. They're all Franklin Saints. So the idea is what would happen if you took Franklin Saint and he was a real life entity as, a, as opposed to just being a character on a fictional show if he stepped in the booth and made an album to let out his innermost deepest thoughts and and that's what the record is about so if you're a snowfall fan you will get every single moment because you'll yeah. be like oh snap he mentioned this he, he's talking about this he's talking about that but the beauty of the project is if i sat there and just retold you what happened on the show mm you wouldn't need to hear it because you already saw the show. Right, right. So the idea is me taking what we've seen on the show and expanding in it in a realistic and believable way. Like, that didn't happen on the show, but it could have based on what did happen on the show. Like, for instance, there's a record called Panthers and Powder where I'm talking about Franklin growing up as a Black Panther and then turning into this drug kingpin that we learned about in the 80s. Mm -hmm. They've showed you on the show that he grew up as a Panther, but they didn't really get super super into it mm -hmm. they show you little moments they show you okay alton his father was a panther they was in oakland and he brought him to the rallies and pick your head up son and fix your fix your coat fix your beret but they never really showed him out there in the marches with him 
So I took the record and said, okay, well, what happened as far as him being a Panther? What did he learn? What was he taught? You know, so they hinted at it, but I expanded on it. So that's just kind of an example of what the album is. And it truly is as if Franklin went in the studio and made a record. Mm. How did you, uh, you mentioned the other guys who, who produced the, the album. How did you link up with them and what, what made you choose them for the, the production of the album? Yeah, they reached out uh, a while ago. They reached out about a year ago. We had done a few records in the past, like random little songs here and there. Mm -hmm. And they reached out about wanting to do a, a whole project. And I was always a fan of their production. Mm -hmm. They're what I call very polished producers. So mm -hmm. when you get records from them, intro, verse, hook, as far as the change-ups, right? Mm -hmm. As far as the production of it, it's not just going to be a beat looped up for three minutes, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Here's your intro of how the beat is, and then here's the transition to the verse. Here's the transitions to the hooks. Here's the transitions to the bridge. There's drops and different instrumentation coming in. They're very polished, and, and I'm always a fan of those types of producers. So, you know, I agreed. I was like, yeah, we could totally do it. And I didn't know what I was going to make the album about when I agreed to do an album with them. Mm -hmm. And then... Terry was hitting me, yo, you, you should do some type of snowfall type of themed album. And I was like, you know what, man, you might be on to something. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do it like this. And um, it was the perfect time running with them because I knew what they bring to the table musically mm -hmm. and then what I bring to the table lyrically. So the thing with the album from a production standpoint, there were so many things that I knew in my mind we could not do, right? So for instance, there was a lot of boxes that we couldn't check off, like, we couldn't make the, the album sound like an 80s album. Because mm -hmm. even though the show was in the 80s, right. nobody at 23 would want to hear me rhyming over a bunch of Beastie Boys beats. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that type of stuff. You know, 2023. So we couldn't have 80s type production. We couldn't have a bunch of LA type production because even though the album is based on an LA TV show, mm -hmm. I'm from Brooklyn. You know what I mean? Right. So right. me rhyming over these LA beats, Low Riders and DJ Quick and Dr. Dre stuff will come off weird. Yeah. Now on the flip side, I couldn't rhyme over a bunch of beats that sound like Lars Professor and Pete Rock, which is what I always rhyme to. That's my my backyard. That's my niche. Yeah. But if I'm doing this about an L.A. story, I can't rhyme over a bunch of Pete Rock inspired beats and Lars Professor inspired beats. Yeah. So what we did was the sound that I felt like made the most sense. Yeah. And it's perfect because it doesn't sound like an 80s album, but it fits if we're talking about the context of the show in the 80s and all that. Mm. You know, it doesn't sound like a New York album. But hearing a New Yorker rap over those beats makes sense. It doesn't sound like an L.A. album, but if you're from L.A., you love and, and appreciate and adore the album because yeah. it still brings you those moments sonically about yeah. L.A. So it was just a beautiful middle ground that we were able to walk on. Be because you had to find that middle ground and that happy medium, did this album take a little bit longer to go from, you know, concept to finish line than, than the others? Actually, not really. You know, I've, I've been blessed to be a fast worker and the other guys, ironically, are fast workers as well. So it didn't take long at all. You know, um, I went to D.C. and, um, you know, we, we made some beats together in person, mm -hmm. picking samples, picking out drum loops and chopping stuff together and all that. And then, you know, I, I came back home with a flash drive with a bunch of beats and the majority of them got used on the record. You know, there were mm -hmm. a few beats here and there that Joe would make. Joe was, you know, one of the producers and the other guys, he would make some beats and yo, I just made this joint last night. Let me know what you think, you know, and yo, you know what? That one is crazy. Let, let's add that to the pot. Mm -hmm. But it, it didn't take a while at all. You know, the best thing about it was how organic it was with the creation. You know, I recorded everything here in Atlanta where I live now, but we made the beats together in the lab in DC. So that, that brought it full circle because there was a sound that I was looking for. And once I got there and showed them exactly what it was that I was looking for, mm -hmm. there was a go, you know? And, and the cool thing about the album too, a lot of people ask, yo, did you have to binge watch Snowfall while you were writing it? Mm. Not at all. Mm. Like, I didn't I didn't rewatch one episode, mm. right? And when you hear the album, there's so many Easter eggs that's like, yo, you would think he wrote the show because the way he's pointing out so many Easter eggs that you have to be a diehard Snowfall fan to catch, I didn't rewatch one episode. Mm. So it's just a testament of how much of a fan I am of the show. I didn't have to rewatch it. It was as if I literally lived Franklin's life. It was like moments where, okay, for instance, season three, I think it's episode eight. That shows you how much of a weirdo I am with the show. <laughs> um, season three, I think it's episode eight where, um, spoiler alert for anybody watching, where they mm -hmm. can't find Melody. Mm -hmm. And uh, Andre asks Franklin to help find Melody. So mm -hmm. Franklin goes and get Leon. And Leon's like, yo, you don't know where she at? And Franklin's like, yo, why everybody think I know where she at? That ain't my girl. Mm -hmm. And Leon was like, first one through the door, always got a key. You know, so... 
I threw that in um, Apologies in Order, which is the record where I'm apologizing the melody for everything that's happened. Mm. And, you know, I said, first one through the door should always have a key. But I had 20 more over in the trunk, gift wrap for me. It seemed like automatically you became a mirror and I chose to stare away, like screw all that staring back at me. And I didn't have to go rewatch the show to remember Leon had this one line where he said, yo, first one through the door has got a key. I didn't have to go rewatch it and be like, oh, man, that's a good line. Let me use that. Right. Nah, it was like if he told me that, you know, I, it was almost like if I was just recollecting because mm -hmm. I've seen the show so much. I've watched every episode about four times before wow. I even thought to do the album. I've watched every single episode about four times. So I knew it. I didn't have to rewatch nothing. I just went in the studio and started writing. That, that's dope, man. Has anyone from the show, the producers, directors, the stars, have they connected with you on the album? Yeah, yeah, it's been dope. Um, so the first person I connected with was my man, uh, Trevor Ingleson. And Trevor is one of the executive producers of the show. Um, he's one of the top guys at the table there. And super cool dude. My man, Doug Banker out in L.A. connected me with him. And he's actually a Long Island guy, ironically. Mm. Okay, you know, okay. But, uh, yeah, he, he's, he's one of your people. Yeah, you know what nice, I mean? but, nice. Um, yeah, but he's one of the executive producers of the show. And uh, I, I let him hear the, the album early on. And mm. He was all about it. He's like, yo, this thing is incredible. And he, you know, he told Damson about it. He told Isaiah about it, who plays Leon, and Amin about it, who plays Jerome. And, you know, he kind of started spreading it around. So then when the album came out, uh, Damson Idris, who plays Franklin, uh, did an interview with Rolling Stone. And they asked him about the album. Mm. And he was bigging it up. So that was real smooth. You know, he was talking about, you know, I, I thought it was so beautiful that he did that. And, I got to connect with him. I got to reach out to Sky Zoo and get with him and all that so we can talk about it. So that's been mm -hmm. dope. You know, um, Gail Bean, who plays Wanda, she reached out and we've been messaging back and forth a lot. She reached out about the record. And so now we're talking about connecting and, you know, how we can maybe do something. Who knows? But she's just been showing a lot of love. So shout to Wanda Bell. You know what I mean? She's yeah. been uh, showing a lot of love with it. So it's been dope. I know somebody told me they recently interviewed... Uh, Isaiah John, who plays Leon, and he said the same thing. He was like, yeah, everybody's telling me about it. Everybody's talking about it everywhere I go. Like, shout the sky, man. I got I to gotta sit down with it. So it, it's it's in the air over there in the snowfall world. That, that's dope, man. Once again, this is Knicks Fan TV. Uh, CP the Franchise here. We are talking to Sky Zoo at his new album on streaming platforms now, The Mind of a Saint. Now, Sky, along with being an artist... Ghost Rider, diehard Knicks fan. You watch the games every night. You watch the Knicks fan TV every night. You're also a, a business owner of of, of yeah. many sorts, man. Talk about the, the Burger Bistro down in Atlanta. Yeah, so I got a restaurant, the Burger Bistro, that I own um, down here in the A, man. I've lived in Atlanta for about four years now. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm back and forth in New York all the time. I'm going to be in New York this weekend. I'm back and forth in New York all the time. Uh, but, but I do live in Atlanta now. And uh, I was like, you know what, man, I got this idea to do something and kind of spread the wealth as far as, you know, what I've been blessed to do musically or what I've been able to acquire and attain and everything and kind of expand and invest and grow on that. Mm -hmm. So one of the things was, you know, opening a restaurant. I cook at the crib. I throw a lot of barbecues and different things over the summer. I'm always on the grill. So I was like, yo, you know what, let's, let's do a, a burger restaurant with all my recipes. And so if you see the menu online, I design the entire menu as far as what what the meals are and all that, that's all my work. So open up the Burger Bistro, man, in Douglasville, which is about 25 minutes from the city. Mm. And um, it's, it's booming, man. You know, it's it's been jumping. It's been crazy. And I didn't know it would be that intense as far as how much I'm there, how much I'm I'm really with my hands in the dirt, for lack of a better term. Yeah, it, It's like having a job again, man. I haven't had a job since 06. <laughs> it's like having a job again. Like, I ain't worked since I was 23, man. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, it's, but it's, it's dope, man. It's, it's real dope. Ha have you applied, what, what have you applied at, from your success as an artist to the burger joint to kind of, you know, help things go at, on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, on the surface, I've invited all my celeb friends to come by. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just like I hit you, like, yeah, yo, yeah. When you come to the A, pull up. You know yeah, what I mean? Like, yeah. I've done a lot of that. Um, but also, too, just marketing-wise, I've kind of done a, a lot of the marketing as if I was promoting an album, which has been cool. Like, when we first mm. opened up, man, opening day, the line was wrapped around the parking lot. Mm. It was wrapped around the public's plaza. You know what I mean? Mm. So um, I did all the rollout kind of the way you would do an album. And, so, you know, I did that and, you know, I, so the, the music has helped in that regard, knowing how to deal with people, knowing how to deal with, you know, different situations and things like that. Obviously the grind, if I could wake up, you know, if I could do a show at, you know, I'm on stage 11, 
11 o'clock, midnight, deal with fans, kick it with them, show love, go to the hotel, have to be in the lobby at 5, 6 a.m. for the next flight or the next bus ride or whatever to go to the next city, sometimes the next country if I'm overseas, then I know how to put that same work in and that same element and energy into the restaurant. So that's been you know a, a dope advantage to have as well. How, how do you find that balance between being an artist, you're working on an album, somebody might call you, say, hey, I need some bars written for me on this, that, and the third. Yep. You're, you're, in, you're in Boston, New York, Chicago, Miami these next couple yeah. of days. Then you got to get back to Atlanta to the burger joint. How, how do you find that, oh. that balance? I don't. It's crazy, bro. Because it's, it's, <laughs> everything you just described is exactly what it's like. Yeah. I was at the restaurant the other night shutting down and, you know, counting out the bread and kind of just locking up. And I got a text like, yo so-and-so needs you to write such and such for them. And I had just, I'm literally walking out the door of the restaurant. I'm like, Jesus Christ. Like, it's a blessing. I'm, you know, pinning XYZ, but I'm like, oh my God, like, where's the time? Like, I was going to go home and watch Nick Fan TV. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I was going to go home and watch CP and JD and them, and then I was going to tap out and go to sleep. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah. you know, it's, it's um it's it, there is no bound. Then I got my son who's five years old, you mm -hmm. know, so it ain't like he's 15 and he going out with his girlfriend. Like, yeah, yeah. He's five. He's like, dad, where you at? You know? Yeah, so yeah. let's go watch Blippi. You know what I mean? Right, so, right, right. I'm, I know I'm, the feeling, man. You know, where am I going? I'm just spread everywhere, but it's a blessing because I could be sitting on my hands not knowing what to do, you know? So True. it's a blessing. I just try to juggle the time. It's a good promise to have, man. I, I echo Absolutely. those sentiments, right? You know, echo those sentiments, man. Um, what is, what do you think has been as an independent artist, man? What do you think has been the key to your longevity all these years? Consistency, consistency. You know, I've been an independent artist my entire career. I've had major label offers, major label deals on the table. The pen is right there next to the paperwork, right next to the celebratory champagne bottle. And I've been like, let's wait a second, you know, for whatever reason, um, never no love lost, never no bad blood, but for whatever reason, I'm like, yeah, let's, let's chill on that. Uh, I, and I don't regret any of it. I'm able to afford the life that I want, take care of my family the way I want. My son wants for nothing. I opened up a restaurant on my own. I didn't pull in 10 friends and everybody pool their money together. I opened up a restaurant on my own. I'm a part owner of another company called Rapper Cards where we make trading cards, baseball cards for MCs and producers mm -hmm. and DJs. And that's been going really well. So I got a lot of things going on being an independent artist. Some of these things are the things that major label artists do, right? Like, Two Chains has a restaurant. Ludacris has a restaurant, and like you know, people like that. But independent, quote unquote, underground artist Sky Zoo has his own restaurant that you can pull up any time to see him in. It's his, and he runs the show, and it's his joint, you know. So he also has a, a card company. He also owns the rights to his publishing and his masters. He also ghost writes for a bunch of people on the radio and has plaques all over his wall in his man cave and hangs out with CP and like. Yeah. Yeah, you can do all that cool stuff as an independent artist, sign me up, you know? So that's yeah. that's kind of where I've been able to do it. But it's consistency, you know? It's dropping every single year. It's continuing to elevate and be great every time I drop. You know, you can't take your foot off nobody's neck because the moment you do, they can get up and breathe. And, and we ain't with none of that, you know? Yeah, yeah. C consistency is the key, man. That That's the key yeah. driver. Uh, last question for you, man. You know, you, you're, as I mentioned, your, your tour stops in Boston and New York, Chicago, Miami. You know, what is what is that feeling like when, when you're packing these venues and you jump out in front of the crowd and they're just going in with you verse for verse, bar for bar, city to city, yeah. you're going in, it's the same energy. What, what does that mean for you to this day to still get that love from the fans? It's amazing, man. The day that that gets old is the day that you should tap out. Mm. To anybody watching, anybody who's an artist, inspiring artist, or whatever it may be, the day that that feeling goes away, tap out. The day that you don't get butterflies or excitement or get humbled by the fact that the crowd is going word for word with you and feel that honor just tap out man so when i when i perform and, and we do the shows and the tours and all that no matter where we go the love is just so insane and and i can't thank the people enough for that you know with this album in particular what i noticed and i was talking to my man about it what i noticed is normally when you do shows the crowd is hands in the air doing the whole thing going crazy with this mm. It's, it's kind of like they're watching TV, like mm. they're locked in and they're nodding, but mm. they're spitting every word and they're, they're staring me down. Mm. And my man was telling me, he was like, yeah, bro, like you're literally giving them a TV show on stage. Paint the picture. So at this point, they're watching and they're going word for it. I mean, they're sitting there 
and they're just mouthing <laughs> word for word. But none of this, none of yeah, the rah-rah yeah, thing yeah. locked in is almost as if it's a dissertation, right? right. Almost as if I'm sitting there, you know, uh, giving a commencement speech or something. And I'm just like, damn, like, it was a different experience in a great way. It, it really took me back and humbled me even more. Like, wow, this is crazy. Like, so, you know, my man was like, yeah, man, you're literally bringing a TV show to life. So subconsciously, it's like they're watching the TV and they're going, I mean, word for word. I'm like, yo, the yeah. record just came out last week and y'all going word for word. You know, it, it, it's been amazing, man. You know, when the album came out, the week it came out, um, it was the number one, it was the number one hip hop album in the country. Mm. Number one hip hop album in the country. And we looked at the charts. It was over Drake and 21 Savage. It was mm. over French Montana. It was over Now That's What I Call Music. Nobody beats now that that's what I call music. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. everybody's on those. You know what right, I mean? Right, Huge right, right. Huge record in the world is on those. It was over that. It was the number one hip-hop album in the country, you know, wow. as an independent artist on an independent label. And none of the records are on the radio, you know? Right. Just the people, just the viewers, just people like yourself, just the people. So I'm honored and humbled by that, man. Like, that blew me away, you know? I, yeah charted billboard multiple times I, I got the proof on the walls and everything but to have the number one hip-hop album in the country when drake is out there and his joint is number three or you know french was number five or whatever and then i think drake moved up to two and then now that's what i call music moved up to two and we were everybody was playing piggyback but we was locked in at number one and it was like yo what like we have no budget or anything behind us you yeah. know i'm not on fallon none of that right this is the music and the people and the snowfall fans and like this is crazy, you know, so it was an honor and a blessing, man. That's incredible, man. And it had, I mean, obviously it speaks to your talent as an artist, the longevity, the consistency that you speak on. But it also has to yeah. be rewarded to know that, you know, this concept that you got from the from the Blazers put on of you. all places, the Blazers. To, right? <laughs> to see how that formed and to see the, the fruits of your labor as number one. That got to be rewarded, man. It has to be. No, it's crazy. It's crazy, man. Yeah. And then seeing, you know, the cast and, and, and heads behind the show, you know, um, show that love and everything. It, it's been yeah. crazy. It's, it's been a blessing. When I did it, I didn't do it for that reason. You know, everybody in my circle was asking before the world knew about it, like, yo, you know, you, you gonna try to get it to them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna try to connect the dots, but I didn't do it for that reason. You know, it wasn't, I'm gonna make a Snowfall inspired album so that I could get in on the show and right, get right, music right. on the show and try to be involved. It was for the people, Jamie. man, because I knew what the people would feel and I knew what it meant for the culture. And I knew the, the, the reason conceptually why I did it and the story and the message that I wanted to get out with doing an album like this. You know, I feel like in hip hop, a lot of the quote unquote coke rappers and a lot of what that what the genre has become and some of the greatest records that we grew up on are coke rap records that I love dearly, near and dear to my heart. But a lot of what has become nowadays is all celebratory. It's all, yo, we on the yacht, throwing yeah. keys back off yeah. like footballs we throwing powder in the air like brawn you know it's a lot of that mm. so these kids listening high school college kids listening you know they think it's that and, and and they promote that and then they fall into that but nobody's there with them when they doing 25 to life nobody's there with them when they get in a mandatory 10 nobody's there with them when they man get jammed because the trunk is loaded and they man didn't know the trunk was loaded like nobody's there for them with all that mm. right so i wanted to tell the other side of the story of like, this is what it's really like. Everybody who I know that's that's in the mix and in the scramble like that, none of them are, are really into it. It just pays really well, right? Like they right. hate that job, right. it just pays really well. They'd rather be sitting here with somebody like you, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. and kicking it. Mm -hmm. It just pays well. So I wanted to tell the other side of the story of like, no, this is what it's really like. And yeah. I wanted to use the vehicle of Franklin Saint and Snowfall and that whole world to make it easier for people to get it and make it easier for these kids to understand it and relate to it because of the show. So that was mm. really the message behind it. So having the cast and all of them be behind it and shout it out and talk about it in interviews and stuff, that's just an added bonus as a blessing. You know, I ain't yeah. do it trying to get on with Snowfall. I did it for the people and because I love the show. I love Snowfall. And the reality of it, man, and, and you did a great yeah. job. I'll be there Friday at Brooklyn yeah. Bowl after S and Y. I got to throw the suit on, go to S and Y, then I'm change, go to Brooklyn Bowl. So yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be all over, man. But I'll see you on Friday over there, man. Um, continued success. Thank you for yeah. the time. Definitely appreciate it, man. And um, yeah, man, could just continue to keep it rocking, bro. Thank you, bro. I appreciate you, man. I appreciate what you and Alex and JD and everybody's doing. Salute to the Rom Animal Chuck D. Absolutely. Man, him kick it all the time. And uh, that, that's the homie, man. And, and we've been building real heavy 
And everybody who watches every night, everybody who calls in, everybody who taps in, I literally love the show, bro. Like, for real, for real. Like, I watch it the way I watch Snowfall. You know what I mean? Like, if it's <laughs> yeah. a game, I might miss the game or half the game because I'm running around, but I'm like, yeah, I gotta get to the crib. I gotta watch no, I, I gotta watch uh, Nick Fan TV. <laughs> and then or if, if I don't, if I miss it live, then I catch it right after. Like, yeah. right, cool. It's like one in the morning. It's done. But yo, let me stay up and knock out out. Then it'll be like two hours. I'll be like, damn, CP did two hours tonight. I gotta get up. But I'm like, All right, I'm with it. I'm with it. And I'll do the two hours. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. But um, yeah. So I, I I love what you're doing, bro. I love how you built this brand how you've done it on your terms. You literally changed the dynamic of the media and how the fans and supporters interact with it and, and become it. You said it a while ago. You got a lot of fan TVs now. You got Hawk fan TV, <laughs> Mavs right. fan TV. You got a lot right, of them right. now. Like, the pioneer was Nick fan TV, baby. Blue and orange, everything. So salute to you, man, for real, for real. And whatever y'all need, I'm here. Absolutely, man. We'll definitely do it again. And I'll uh, see you on Friday, man. Sky Zoo, the album is out. The Mind of a Saint Catch it on all streaming platforms and go check out the Burger Bistro down in Douglasville, Georgia, in the Atlanta metro area, man. So this is Nick's yeah. TV. We out of here, man. Peace.